all about birds today and we're going to get into that. Well, why don't we start? Um, so first, thanks everybody for joining. I'm Kristen from Grow NYC. We've also got Sarah with us from Grow NYC today too. Um, Sarah from Eco Schools is here as well as part of our um, outdoor learning education series. And we are very excited to welcome Lily and Yamina from Audubon today, who are gonna be teaching us all about the birds that we can see in and around New York City. Um, so why don't I turn, I'm gonna turn it over to Yamina and Lily, but just a quick reminder that we are recording um, and we are gonna share, you'll, if you've missed the beginning or if you need to sign out a little bit early, we are gonna record the video and we're gonna share it with you after. So you will be able to access the info. Um, and if you have questions, we're gonna save them for the end. You can put them in the Q&A and we'll read them to Yamina and Lily for you at the end. So um, without further, I'm gonna turn it over to our Audubon experts today. Hey everyone, um, I am Yamina. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Lily. Uh, we are both from Audubon, New York. Uh, and we're going to be talking about bird ID and native plants. Um, so Audubon New York is one of the state offices of the National Audubon Society. Um, and our mission is to conserve bird habitats. So um, we want to protect the spaces that birds live in uh, using science and advocacy and education um, like today's program. Uh, so we are going to begin by doing a little um, birding 101, how to identify birds. Um, so pretend, you know, we're all outside on a walk all together. Um, we look over and we see this beautiful bird and we pretend we don't know what it is. We want to identify it. Um, what sort of things can we use to identify this bird? How would you describe this bird? Um, I'll give you a second to put your answers into the chat. Um, so what do we observe about this bird that could help us identify it? Um, so yeah, we could notice its colors. Um, like someone mentioned that orange breast, um, the, the color of the beak, it's kind of like a yellow beak. Um, if we were in person, we could listen to it. That would be very helpful. Um, the size of the bird, um, location, what it's eating. Yeah, so all of these are things that could help us identify this American Robin. Um, so whether you've been birding for a day or a year or 10 years, um, you are going to use field marks to identify birds. And these are the things that help us um, tell birds apart. So um, people, you all mentioned size, so obviously small, medium, large. You can also compare it to another bird. To another bird, so is it smaller than a pigeon, bigger than a pigeon? Use it, compare it to something that you are familiar with. Uh, what color is it? So people mentioned the orange breast. Um, you can also say it's colorful, or actually it was more of a dull camouflage color. Um, those are really helpful. What shape is it? Um, is it long and slender? Is it sort of small and round? Um, the pattern, so you all mentioned that just the breast of the bird was orange. And so that's sort of like a mark, right? It's not orange all over, um, but they are things like spots or stripes or, or markings on specific parts of, of the bird's body. We'll look at some birds that have that. Sound. So is it singing or is it calling out? What does that sound like? Wing clap. Um, also, some of you mentioned birds that make distinctive sounds um, not by singing, but uh, the woodpecker will drum, right? When it pecks on, on a tree. Um, some people learn the different drummings. Uh, some birds like the morning dove make sound when they, um, when they first take off, the air moving through its wings makes a very specific sound. Uh, that can help you identify it. Uh, habitat helps identify birds. So yeah, where did you see it? Um, is it in the forest, desert, marsh, urban? You can be even more specific. Um, what type of forest is it? Are the trees mostly deciduous, carnivorous? Um, is it freshwater? Is it saltwater? 
Um, all of these are things that can help you narrow it down. Um, and behavior, right? So we saw that bird, it was eating a berry. That's really helpful. Also, um, how does it move? Does it hop along the ground? Um, when it flies, does it flap its wings a lot or it doesn't flap its wings a lot? Um, how it eats, what it eats, even its posture. So every detail is helpful. Non nothing is too small. Um, all of these are things that you can use to help you identify uh, what bird you're, you're seeing or hearing. So let's practice using our field marks right here. We've got two um, types of sparrows, house and chipping. Um, some birds like to call these LBJs, little brown jobs, because from a distance, um, they look like cute little brown fluffs. But then when you get closer, you can see the differences. So again, in the chat, if you want to tell me what the differences that you notice are between these two birds, um, we can work on our field mark identification skills. So how can we tell a house sparrow apart from a chipping sparrow? So beak and belly color is different. The stripes on the head. Um, the, yeah, the chipping has that rusty color. It has a bit of a crest. Um, the house sparrow has that black beak. Um, someone mentioned um, that this one is a little bit rounder. So actually, um, birds can fluff themselves up, right? So this picture, it looks like it might be winter, it might be cold. This is actually something birds do to help them keep warm. Warm. So in the winter, um, Lily and I will joke that all of the birds are really cute and fluffy because they all puff up, um, they trap air in their feathers and that air sort of like warms up and it's like having a built-in um, like puffer coat. Um, but yeah, so you all pointed out a lot of great stuff, beak color, head, markings, right? So the house sparrow has this black on its neck um, and on its breast. Um, the chipping has a very distinct rust colored cap. It's got that line through the eye. Um, all of these are things that will help you tell the difference between the two. Um, another helpful marker is sound. So if you look at an American crow and you look at a fish crow, it's really hard to tell them apart just by sight. Um, apparently fish crow is slightly smaller. I've never noticed that in person. Um, and so the best way to tell these two apart is by listening. So we're actually going to listen to these birds and we'll think about how we can describe these sounds differently. So let's listen to the American crow. And we can listen to the fish crow. So, ooh, sorry, I paused it by mistake. Um, So how would you describe these two sounds? Obviously they sound very different, but a really good skill is to think about how to describe it. So yeah, right in the chat, American crow sound is more harsh. Um, the pitch is different. So the fish crow has a higher pitch. It's more like a nasally sound. Um, the, there's a different tone and pattern to the call. So the crow has that um, more typical caw sound that, um, that we think of. And then the fish crow has a very nasally sound that kind of sounds like um, uh, a toy, someone said. And I think that's pretty accurate. It does kind of sound like a squeaker toy. Um, okay, so other field marks that can help us are habitat. Um, so these two birds are um, nearly identical, um, but you would be able to tell them apart by habitat. So on the left, we've got the least flycatcher, 
That you're probably going to find it on um, edges of forest or woods or old orchards, whereas the Acadian flycatcher probably um, in, uh, in swamps. Um, so again, that is the best way to tell them apart. There are other things you can use, but they're like super advanced and I don't think about that stuff. So habitat actually can be surprisingly helpful. Um, and uh, behavior. So, whoops, sorry about that. Here we go. Um, so what is the bird doing? So we're gonna watch this palm warbler. As you might have noticed the entire time the warbler, the palm warbler was sort of like bobbing its tail. Um, it's the only yellow bird that's, you know, only yellow warbler you're gonna see that's gonna do that. Um, and so that's pretty much a given. So even if you can't get a very close look at its field, other field marks, once you see a warbler pumping its tail, it's a palm warbler. Um, so that's sort of like its tell, which is really helpful. And then let's talk about um, birds you can see right in uh, New York City. So our most common New York City birds actually all happen to be non-native. Um, so the house sparrow, the European starling, the rock pigeon, they're not from here. This one even has it in its name, European starling. Um, these are European birds that were brought over. Um, so they're all non-native. I would say the house sparrow and the European starling are invasive. That means that they steal resources from other birds. So things like food or um, nesting space. Um, if you walk around and look at most of the New York City trees, if you look at um, whatever like openings they have, it's usually one of these two nesting in them. Pigeons are not native, but I would say they don't necessarily steal resources. They have such so few taste buds that they can eat whatever they find. Um, and they make their own um, very lazy, sloppily made nests wherever. So they're not really taking anything from anyone. But um, they were brought over. They had no native um, natural predators because they're new. And so they just sort of exploded. And now you can see them everywhere. Uh, resident birds, these are birds that are going to be here the whole year, um, as opposed to migrating birds, which we'll talk about in a second. But these are the birds that you're going to see through the winter, um, including uh, Lily's beloved black cap chickadee. Um, it's, first of all, it's nice to see birds in the winter. Um, there's less food, so a lot of these birds are going to be in very specific spots. If you know a place that has feeders, like, say, Central Park, um, these are the birds you're probably going to see there. Um, it's also helpful to get to know them because then once migration starts, it can be a little bit overwhelming. But if you've got these down, if you like are familiar with them, you can start to pick up on the new, um, the new sounds and the new sights. So let's just really quickly listen to some of these. So the blue jay, named after that, whoops, sorry, named after that loud jay scream, also helpful because sometimes they'll let you know when there's a raptor around. You hear lots of them screaming. It happened to me this morning. Um, it might mean that they're like warning each other about something. So you can keep an eye out for a red tailed hawk or something. Uh, morning dove. That sound at the end, that's the sound I mentioned that happens when they take off. That's the air moving through their wings. Um, morning dove. Lots of beginning birders, myself included. I did this too. Um, people think that it might be an owl. It's a morning dove. Northern Cardinal. Always fun, very loud. Uh, this time of year, the males are singing to sort of mark off their territory. Um, so if you uh, live near trees, um, you might have one getting ready to nest there and you might, like me, get woken up to this Northern Cardinal letting everyone know that's his tree. 
Um, tough to titmouse, which actually is related to the black cap chickadee. Um, so sometimes people use mnemonic devices to help them remember uh, what a bird sounds like. Uh, the tough to titmouse, it's mnemonic devices, Peter, Peter, Peter. And that's how um, it might help you remember how that sounds. Um, black cap chickadee. Again, named after what it says, chickadee dee dee dee. Um, and finally, the red bellied woodpecker, um, which is actually pretty distinctive by sound. Yeah, so this was one of the first bird sounds that I learned um, because to me it kind of sounds like a little chihuahua. Um, and so whenever I would hear what sounded like a dog, Sort of like yapping, I would know there was a woodpecker around and then I could narrow it down from there. Um, these are birds that are going to be migrating through uh, now and through May. Migration has started. Um, so the ruby-throated hummingbird, this is the only hummingbird we have on the east coast. So if you see a hummingbird, it's like 99% going to be a ruby-throated hummingbird. Sometimes we get vagrants. Um, most of us know they are nectar eaters, so they'll eat the nectar from flowers. They will also eat insects. Um, and keep an eye out, because sometimes I'll think it's like a dragonfly or an insect and then realize it's a hummingbird because they're so tiny and fast. Common yellow throat, so you can see um, this is the male. He's got that beautiful black mask, the yellow throat. The female will not have the black mask, but she'll have a very distinct yellow throat, sort of like tan gray green back. Um, they prefer to be down low um, and they prefer to be near water. Um, so again, with that thing where habitat is really helpful, um, that is most likely where you'd see a common yellow throat. Black and white warbler. Um, so just to, um, sorry, common yellow throat is a type of warbler. Um, black and white also warbler. Um, you can see it's got that very, those very beautiful um, sharp black and white stripes. Um, it's kind of similar to a nuthatch, which I mentioned earlier, it kind of hangs out on tree bark, but it's going to walk differently and move differently. Um, we can see this one um, found a juicy bug somewhere on that tree. Um, Baltimore Oriole, really beautiful um, orange bird. Um, they like to eat fruit. Um, so some people have Baltimore Oriole feeders and they will put out um, sliced oranges out for them. Um, they make amazing nests that kind of hang like a pendulum from the tree and sometimes you can um, find them afterwards, they'll leave them. Uh, and a red winged blackbird um, prefers uh, marshland. Um, so you can see they kind of like to hang out on um, reeds and cattails and all that fun stuff. Um, very loud birds, blackbirds tend to be um, very friendly and you tend to see flocks of them. So if you see one red, red ringed blackbird, you're probably gonna see more. And then um, this hermit thrush, um, they prefer the woods. Um, robins actually are also a type of thrush. They, you can sort of hear it in their flute-like song. Um, thrushes like the hermit and the wood thrush are struggling a bit because of loss of habitat because they like the woods, um, but we do still get them um, and they are really fun to listen to. Um, hermit thrush, you're probably gonna see uh, low on the ground. Um, and so that's another thing that's really helpful, right? So I mentioned common yellow throat in those low bushes near water, um, hermit thrush on the ground in the leaves in the woods, but a Baltimore Oriole will be higher up because it's gonna be looking for fruits and things like that. Um, and so actually, I'm going to pass things off to Lily, who is going to talk about uh, native plants. Great. Thank you so much, Jamina. Um, so yeah, we're going to move on and talk about why you should plant native plants. Okay, so first thing, so native plants are better for people and the environment. Um, so it's really common to have lawns with 
with grass and you know you need to mow them or you need to use a weed whacker and it's actually not the best for the environment um, using all these mowers and weed whackers and um, the EPA actually estimates that 17 million gallons of fuel are spilled each year when people are refueling their weed whackers so that ends up in runoff and in the soil and in other sources of water nearby. So um, yeah, definitely better to not have lawns. Um, instead, it would be better to replace them with native plants to have cleaner air and decrease water pollution. And the next one is native plants. So you don't need to use as much water. So you save water when you plant native plants. Once again, when you have like a lawn with grass, you really need to take care of that grass by watering it. And um, it's actually estimated that in, in American cities, I think the EPA estimates that about, let's 30 to 60% of the fresh water is actually used just for watering lawns, which is a lot of water. And you can click on the next one. Um, so native plants also kind of help control flooding and they decrease runoff. Next. And also when you plant native plants, you don't have to use as many chemicals. So you don't have to fertilize as much and you don't have to use as many pesticides. Um, that's because native plants are often hardier than non-native ornamentals and they can thrive without um, additional fertilizers or the use of pesticides on them. Also, when you make a native garden, insects that you previously looked at, you thought they were pests, they actually become allies. You realize that if you do have, let's say an oak tree that has holes in it, you realize, oh, well, that's because a bunch of caterpillars did that. So that means you actually have a successful garden. So um, we shouldn't necessarily look at um, insects eating our plants in the garden as a negative thing. Um, and the last and the next point is reduce, you don't have to maintain them. Native plants are easier to maintain just for the reasons I mentioned above. They don't require as much water, pesticides or fertilizer. And then the last point here, native plants are better for birds. And that is really important. Um, if we want to be able to, you know, enjoy birding and seeing birds in our backyards and in other green spaces, then we should really plant native plants. And we will, on the next slide, talk more about that. I think you can just, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so native plants are, you can click all of it, through all of it. Okay, great. Um, okay, so native plants provide um, food and shelter for birds. So there are four different food groups. Um, there are berries and fruits, nuts and seeds, nectar, and the last one, which is actually maybe the most important one, if anyone can think of what that last food group for birds are, that I did not put on this list, but I'm sure some of you can guess in the chat. Let's see. Yes, insects. So it's insects. The last one is insects, and insects are really important for birds, and we can go to the next slide. Okay, so 96% of land birds feed insects to their chicks. So if we want more birds and we want birds to be successful in raising their young, then they need to be able to have lots of insects. And we can go to the next slide. So 90% of the insects that eat plants can actually only eat the native plants that they co-evolved with. So insects are don't necessarily want to eat the non-native ornamental plants you're plant, you might be planting in your yard. Um, it's just not what they have evolved to eat and they won't, won't flourish on those kind of plants. Next. So let's uh, take these two trees. So like a native oak tree on the left. So a native oak tree can, um, can provide a great uh, habitat for 550 different species of butterflies and moths to 
you know, have uh, leave their caterpillars on, while a ginkgo tree can only really host five different species of butterflies and moths. So that is a significant difference. So you can really see how important it is to have these native plants. So 500 versus only five. Okay, next. I think you can click one more time. Okay, so, um, so nestlings in one day, they can eat up to 390 to 570 caterpillars per day. So it's really important to have that native oak, native oak tree that can host hundreds of caterpillars versus a ginkgo tree that can only host five caterpillars. Um, so a, let's say a clutch of chicks can eat over 9,000 caterpillars between the time they hatch and the time they fledge, so that when they leave the nest. Okay, so now let's look at some, let's look at plants for birds. So plants for birds is um, actually a native plant database that um, Audubon made. So you can actually just type in your zip code and um, it will show you plants that are good for your area. And you can even um, filter based on what kind of plant you want or maybe what kind of birds you're interested in attracting. So we can go to, yep. So let's just take a closer look at a couple of plants. So I actually put in my zip code uh, and I got these three plants that we're gonna look at here. So the first one is American pokeweed. Another name for that is pokeberry or pigeonberry. And this is kind of um, like a tall branching herbaceous perennial. And um, it has reddish stems, as you can see in this picture here, and it has these long clusters of small white flowers in the spring that, that um, turn into these berries in late summer and fall. And this is a really good food source um, for birds, especially during fall migration when these berries are ripe, um, fall migration is also happening. Um, one thing about this plant, I will just note that all parts of this plant are toxic to humans if you eat it. And then we have um, on the other side of this slide, so some birds that this plant might attract. And um, when you use the Plants for Birds website, they will always uh, show you what birds the plant might attract. So here we have finches, crows and jays, thrushes, cardinals, and grosbeaks. Next. So this next plant here is um, butterfly milkweed. And um, this is a nectar rich perennial. And um, these large orange blooms are really attractive to butterflies and hummingbirds. And it says here, it also might attract thrushes, waxwings and woodpeckers. And the last plant we're gonna take a look at is the chestnut oak tree. So this is a deciduous uh, tree and it produces um, these chestnut brown acorns that is a really good food source for birds and other wildlife like squirrels. And this tree might attract mockingbirds and thrashers, cardinals and grosbeaks, chickadees and titmice, and even orioles. So after you use um, the Audubon Plants for Birds database to get a list of native plants you were interested in planting, um, we have some tips uh, to create a successful native garden after getting your list. So I think the first thing that's really important is to get to know your space. Um, so you kind of need to know what kind of soil you have. Um, so maybe it's really moist soil, maybe it's dry, maybe it's clay-like or loamy. So that's first a really important thing to do. It's also good to assess um, how much sun and shade you get in your yard. And to do that, it's really important to actually look at your space at different times of the day. Because, you know, the sun changes and the shadows might change at different times of the day. So an area you might think is a sunny spot might not be as sunny as you think. Maybe it's only it's partial shade. Maybe it only gets sun for a couple of hours in the morning and the rest of the day it's in the shade. So 
that's the first thing you should really get to know your space so you can you know what plants fit best in your space. And then you can go on to picking your plants. So when you pick your plants, you might want to think about the different seasons. Um, so some plants might provide a better food source for birds earlier in the season. And then other plants like the um, pokeberry we saw earlier might be better later in the season in the, summer, in the late summer and fall. So you might wanna kind of vary your plants so you have things that birds will like throughout um, the seasons. And you also wanna make sure you vary your food group. So you want to maybe pick some berries, um, some plants that provide maybe nuts and even some berries, I'm sorry, some plants that are really attractive to certain insects. And then the next step is to plan out your garden. And in this step, you might actually want to even do like a rough sketch of your, of your garden. So, you know, kind of plot everything on paper where you're going to put different plants. And you really wanna be careful not to overcrowd things. Um, it might be tempting because you might think, oh, I have all this space to fill and the, the plants you might be getting might be small, but native plants really kind of flush out and, you know, take up more space. Um, and so you don't want to overcrowd them. Um, in addition to when you're planning it out, you also want to take into consideration the different heights of the plants. So you want to put, you know, the shorter plants in the front and taller plants in the back. And the last thing, oh, actually one more thing about when you plan, um, plan your, when you're planning your garden is that you might want to, um, like certain perennials, um, so plants that come back every year, you might want to um, plant them in mass. So that means plant five plants or more because um, pollinators and birds, they, they like to kind of go from one clump of flowers to the next clump. So that's kind of their, um, how they like to feed. So if you plant multiple of the same plant in like a clump, um, that is better than kind of scattering them around. Um, so the next one, decide when to plant. So it's probably best not to plant in the middle of the summer. It's gonna be really hot and that's really gonna be stressful for the plants, um, you know, making that adjustment. Um, so a good time to plant is in the springtime, um, but I will say that sometimes in the fall time, you might actually get some better discounts with plants. So maybe you want to look at plants in the fall when they might be a little less expensive. Um, and certain plants actually, you know, do well um, being planted in the fall. So trees and shrubs um, do well being planted at that time. And um, the last thing, you, well, not the last, second to last, um, you probably will want to call the nursery or the garden center ahead of time. So it can be a little tricky finding native plants. Um, so I definitely wouldn't just, just go to a nursery or a garden center and expect them to have what you want. So um, you can call them, see what they have. They may not have the same exact plants you're looking for, but they might have same type of plant, but maybe a different cultivar that you can kind of substitute with. And maybe they don't have what you're looking for yet. They don't have it in yet, but they might be getting it. So just kind of getting a sense of um, what they have in stock and when they'll be getting things so you don't just show up and end up not having what you want. Um, and it's also kind of important to plan what you're getting ahead of time because I know it's really tempting to um, kind of just go to a nursery or a garden center and just look at the plants and browse and just pick whatever you think looks really nice. I mean, I know for me, I definitely kind of uh, fall into that where I just see something and I'm like, oh, that plant, I want that. But you really should try to pick things that will be good for your space, your garden. So try to keep that in mind when you do go to a nursery, check the labels, see what the requirements are for that plant to be successful.
Um, so yeah, when you're at the nursery, make sure to check the tags. But of course, you know, you don't have to be so rigid with your planning. Perhaps something that was on your list initially ends up being there, then you should go ahead and definitely get it. Um, okay. And then I know not all of us have, you know, a backyard or that much space to plant. So you can even do a container garden. So if you have just like a small balcony or patio, then um, container garden, you can definitely do a native container garden. That's definitely a great option. Um, I would say just follow the same steps as uh, before in terms of planning what you want, looking at your space, how much sun there is, um, kind of deciding what size pots you want. And if you are going to plant more than one item in the same pot, just to make sure that all those plants have the same requirements in terms of um, sunlight and watering. Okay, so where can you see some native plants and where can you go birding in New York City? So there are actually quite a few great places that have native plants. So in Central Park, you have uh, an area called Dean Slope. So this is a, a native meadow. Um, this is a native meadow and it's, it's a meadow, but it's not flat, it's actually on a hill. So they have some really beautiful kind of rustic trails there. Um, lots of lovely plants, native plants. And I would say right now there isn't that much to see at the meadow, but as the summer goes on and, and even through the fall, it is definitely a really lovely place to look for birds. And um, the next location is the High Line. So the High Line actually has 100,000 native plants, trees and shrubs planted there. So another great place. And one other thing, so if you are planning on doing a native garden, it might be good to maybe look at some native gardens to kind of get some ideas of what, how you want your space to look. Um, okay, so the next one, the New York Botanical Garden, they also have a native plant garden. It's about 3.4 acres. And they also have about 100,000 different plants, trees, and shrubs. And the last one we have here, here is the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Um, they have something called the Native Flora Garden, and it has actually several different um, parts to it. There is a small forest, there's a meadow, a bog, and a pine barrens habitat. So they, their native garden is varied, and um, they have lots of different examples of different native habitats. Um, thank you, Lily. So um, I'll be talking about other resources you can use when you're out. Um, there are some useful apps that are free um, and that you can download to your phone. Um, the Merlin app is from um, Cornell Labs of Ornithology. Um, you can use it to um, identify birds um, either by picture or um, you can use it just like as a regular bird guide and sort of scroll through it. Um, it has regionalized packs, which is super helpful. So um, they have one for the Northeast and then um, I have family in Puerto Rico. And when I go, I can download the Caribbean um, uh, pack. Uh, obviously, oops, sorry about that. Obviously we have an app, Audubon does have an app. Um, this one's cool too, because you can, um, if you're looking for a specific species, um, people can report where they saw that bird. Um, so that is helpful. Um, it also is just like a full guide of North American birds. And then of course there's iNaturalist, which is great because it isn't just for birds. Um, you can use it to help you identify plants, um, fungi, insects, um, reptiles, you name it. Um, iNaturalist is a community science app, um, which means that when you um, take a picture of something to identify it. You can post where you found it. Um, it will suggest um, IDs and other people in the community can look at your picture and suggest what they think it might be. Um, so by 
doing iNaturalist, you would be um, participating in community science, which is always great. Um, speaking of community science, the eBird website and app are um, bird specific um, community science resources. So with eBird, you can um, log on to um, keep track of what birds you've seen. Um, you can also use their map to, um, uh, if you're going to a specific spot and you wanna see what you should be keeping an eye out for, you can click on the spot and you can um, check what's been seen there recently. Uh, the eBird app just uh, updated and they have this great explore um, uh, thing where it's a map where you can figure out where you are and you can actually see what birding spots are near you, which is super helpful. Um, and there is, of course, the Cornell Labs feeder watch cam, which is always fun. It's a great way to practice your um, birding um, from the comfort of your own home. It's also really relaxing to have on in the background when you're working. Um, and we can actually do a little virtual birding. Let me just... Um, up the browser. So like I said, um, Cornell uh, Feeder Watch. So this it, feeder is up at, um, it's up in Ithaca on the Cornell um, property. Um, so it's four hours north. But the birds you see here are actually birds that you could see in New York City. So already, these are a lot of the birds that we talked about. So, you know, someone's favorite is right here. Um, we've got the red winged blackbird, we've got the starlings. Um, another really great thing about this website is that if you scroll down, they have a guide right here. So, this is updated um, by season. And so, if you see a bird that you might not be able to recognize, you can scroll down and you can um, have a guide right here. Um, another cool thing is that, well, right now the feeder is busy, but if it wasn't, you would be able to sort of go back and jump back to the morning when birds are um, really active. Um, so this is, like I said, a really great resource for working on your bird ID. Um, and so if we, maybe we can jump back and let's see if we can work on our, oh, watch out. Oh, here we are. So we can work on our, um, our observation skills. So we've got um, someone right here and maybe we can practice looking at field marks on this bird right here. So is there any, um, anything that you notice about this bird that's significant? How would we identify it? So um, from judging from where it is and how it's eating, um, we could so we guess this this is a type of woodpecker. Um, we can look at its colors. Um, so it's clinging to a tree. Um, I'm gonna go back so we can get a better look at it. It's black and white. It's got that red spot on its head. Um, and so the reason uh, this is always a fun bird to look at is because if we scroll down here, we'll see that it actually looks like it could be either a hairy or a downy. These two birds are really similar looking. Um, you can see they've got the black, the lattice, the red, the stripes. Um, so this is one of those birds where you have to really pay close attention to the bird to figure out, is it a hairy or is it a downy? Um, and so going off of these pictures, what do you think the biggest difference is between these two birds? Let 
So if I'm trying to tell a downy apart from a hairy, um, yeah. So the beak is really gonna be the best giveaway on the hairy. Um, you can see on the hairy and the downy. So we can see that for the hairy, the beak is the same length as the head. For the downy, it's about half the length. So if we go back up and we're looking at this bird, do we think this is a hairy or do we think this is a downy? And again, we can cheat by, uh, it flew off, but we can rewind and we can get a better look at it. Yeah, so going off of the beak, I agree. I would say it's a hairy. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes you don't get a good angle, but here we did definitely got a good angle um, and we were able to tell them apart. Uh, let's see if we can go further back. So birds tend to be active early in the morning. It's um, 5 p.m. So they might not be at, as active. You know, some of you might also know that that um, dawn chorus, right? So the sun comes up and all the birds start singing. Again, so you have to jump around a little bit. And you can also hear, right? There's a lake so you can hear um, geese in the background. Um, you can keep an eye out. Oh, actually, you can see the geese right here. Um, you can keep an eye out for any types um, type of um, heron or um, egrets. Uh, so this is, like I said, I can't stress this enough. It's like a really fun tool to have on hand um, when you don't feel like leaving the house, but wanna wanna look at some birds anyway. Um, so I'm gonna just. Uh, switch us back to um, our presentation. Um, and uh, we can take some time to answer any questions uh, that people might have. Okay, so let's see what we have. I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Now's the time, folks. So if we have questions, let's okay. Um, do we have a tape of a song sparrow? Um, so I'm sorry, you're saying you so someone wants to hear a song sparrow? I think so. Um, is yeah. that what you mean? Friend, a tape? yes, they would like to hear the song sparrow. <laughs> yeah, so if you go to um uh, you can stay here at All About Birds um, and you can search Song Sparrow. You can, of course, also go to the Audubon website. Um, got a lot going on, on my computer. Um, and we can listen to a Song Sparrow. So Song Sparrows are cool, actually, because they have regional dialects. So the same way someone from the South doesn't sound like someone from the Northeast, Sometimes song sparrows will sound different um, in different areas. Um, so that is the song sparrow. It's three, um, do, 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 and then just sort of like a bunch of garble. Um, okay. um, so we have a few more here. Are there or what native birds in our area are considered endangered? Um, so I mentioned um, the wood thrush is one that's endangered. There's a few warblers that are endangered. Um, Audubon has a really great resource um, uh, on their website that lets you sort of look at how climate change is affecting birds. Mm -hmm. um, off the top of my head, wood thrush, um, cerulean warbler, Lily, what else? Um, uh, I think it was also golden winged warbler, or was it? 
Yeah, golden wing warbler. They have um, they have a whole list of um, birds yeah. of conservation concern on the Audubon website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you go to Audubon New York too, they'll list birds of conservation concern. Someone mentioned plovers. Yeah, plovers are not doing great. It's also by habitat, right? So think about which habitats we're destroying um, or are being destroyed. Um, and you can sort of think about which birds might be in trouble. Oh, here's, here's one. What's the best way to keep a squirrel off my bird feeder? That's a good uh, question. <laughs> would it harm the birds? There's two parts to this one. Would it harm the birds if I put Vaseline on the roof of the bird feeder so the squirrel can't sit on top? Um, well, it I'm not sure what kind of bird feeder you have, but they're definitely um, like devices you can get. Um, so there is this one, um, so you have like a feeder on a pole, you don't want the squirrel to climb up the pole and get to the, your bird uh, feeder. So you can get this like kind of a uh, thing that goes around. So it prevents the squirrels from getting up the pole to the feeder. And um, I think you mean that we actually have a video of this working. So what happens is the squirrel gets on this thing and it like actually spins the squirrel around and then they just kind of fall off. So there are lots of um, different things out there uh, that you can look at. I've heard slinky too. I haven't tried it out, but I've heard a slinky might work. Um, and then I know some people will add um, chili oil to the food. Um, it, that won't affect the birds. The capsaicin doesn't hurt them, um, but the squirrels will be able to apparently taste the capsaicin. Um, next question is kind of on related. Are there any bird feed or feeder that you would recommend? I think it kind of depends what kind of birds you want to attract because there are different types of feeders available. Um, do you have, what do you think, Yamina? No, I don't, I, like Lily said, yeah, it depends on, are you talking suet, which, I mean, I just ordered the cheapest one off Amazon because that's just a gauge. Um, do you want a finch feeder? Um, just like a, do you want one of those large like house feeders? Um, I think Audubon, I don't know if we have an article on the best feeders, um, but I know Wild Birds Unlimited is sort of the go-to when it comes to feeders. Um, quickly, I just saw something from earlier that I wanted to kind of address. So someone said um, they thought that native oaks were more or less gone. Um, so I think maybe what they're thinking about are American elm trees in the US, they really have suffered. Um, but native oak trees, we still have um, plenty of those around. So I just wanted to address that person's question that was like from a while ago. Um, we have a, somebody wants to know what's your favorite bird or bird song? Hmm. Um, so I think Yumina is having something, an issue with her, her computer. That's why she's frozen. Yeah. Um, so. Are you back, Yumina? <laughs> oh, okay. And maybe that was quick. She was, she's back now. Yumina, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was like, oh, it's going to die. And then I did nothing about it. And then it died. Um, so apologies <laughs> for that. No worries. Um, We've got, someone is wondering what your favorite birds or bird songs are. Hmm, okay. Um, I, yeah, I'm partial to the thrushes. Um, Wood and hermit thrush, they sort of, it's like a flute-like sound. And so it's like ethereal, like you're walking through the woods and all of a sudden there's like a flute playing in the background. Um, and there's something pretty magical about that. Lily, are you partial to any bird song? I think, I mean, I don't know if I would say this is like my favorite bird song to hear. Like, I'm not sure it's the most beautiful, but I think bobolinks sound really interesting. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And then we've got one more question here before, um, there might be some more in the chat, which I'll tag Sarah on in a sec. Um, this person says they have a lot of black, birds in um, their backyard near their bird bath. And they're wondering if they are, like, how would you tell the difference between a crow and a raven? 
Um, so, uh, ravens are massive. Um, they're very big and people say it's a um, beak with a bird, whereas a crow is going to be smaller. Um, you have lots of birds in your bath though. I might look at like a starling or a grackle instead of a crow. Um, crows are, even though they're smaller than ravens, they're still pretty big. Um, and I don't know if they hang out at many bird baths. So I would look at um, European starling um, or grackle. Lily, did, did you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Maybe look at a common grackle. Okay. Okay, now, um, this person has a bird feeder hanging on a shepherd's hook and a squirrel deterrent on a pole, on the pole. The squirrel jumps to the top of the pole and hangs down the line that holds the feeder and then sits on top of the feeder. They tried cayenne pepper and curry pepper, but hoping Vaseline on the top would not harm the birds, but would let the squirrel slide off. What do you think? Yeah, so it looks like you've tried different techniques. I know some people, you know, they kind of like, oh, you know what, if the squirrels are going to come, I'm going to just make a separate feeder for them. And they actually have like, a separate little feeder for the squirrels. So they kind of leave the bird feeder alone, kind of. I don't know. That's one thing I've seen. If I feel like at that point, you've kind of maybe just accepted the situation in terms of really trying to prevent the squirrel. I'm not sure. I mean, I feel like you've tried a lot. What do you think, Yamina? I mean, I'm thinking of that obstacle course that someone put up um, to keep squirrels off their feeders and then the squirrels like learned the obstacle course and got there anyway <laughs> um so I think sometimes you just kind of got to learn to embrace it um are they so I mean I don't I don't think they keep the birds off the feeder thankfully but I I get not wanting to feed all the squirrels in your neighborhood um but yeah I can't they're really smart honestly I don't know <laughs> I think one person in the chat had asked about native plants because I mentioned that um, one of the plants was poisonous to humans and they asked oh. others that are poisonous to dogs. And I would say probably yes. So if you want to plant native plants, but you're worried about letting your dogs in outside and having them potentially eat something, then you should probably also kind of double check and look into that. We have a list of, um, I think it's the ASPCA or the Humane Society or somebody did a list of like common plants and whether or not they're um, poisonous to cats and dogs. So we can share that in the follow-up resources as well. Um, growing up, somebody was told that if they go near a bird nest that might, the birds might desert the nest. Is that a myth or a fact? I think it depends on the bird. Um, so shorebirds are really sensitive. Um, and so if you're at the beach and you see um, a part that's roped off, it's roped off for a reason. And it might be because birds are nesting there. Um, but I, Lily and I have been talking about the fact that there's a robin nesting right outside my window, right next to the door. Um, and obviously that robin chose that spot to make its nest. So I think it, it depends on the species. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think some birds are more sensitive to being disturbed. Other birds, actually, if you disturb them at their nest, they might even become aggressive. Um, like I've seen uh, people posting videos like, oh, some a bird built um, a nest like right by their front entrance. And then every time they go in their house, this bird is diving, dive bombing them. But then birds, yeah, are more sensitive and they might just, yeah, they might abandon the nest location. Um, okay, so here's a behavioral, a behavioral bird question. There are large blackbirds that have attacked a mockingbird um, and attacked their eggs and also ducklings in the area. Do those sound like ravens or crows? This is also near the Jersey Shore. Hmm. Um, I mean, so corvids in general are bullies. Um, so crows and, and blue jays, um, they do like to mob um, other birds and scare them off. So like they'll go for like hawks too. They just have no fear. Um, if it's near the shore, they could be fish crow. Um, 
But mockingbirds are also really territorial, so that might just be like they have beef with each other. <laughs> <laughs> and then how would you attract, what are some good ways to attract goats and blue jays to your feeder? Um, Lily? I was going to say, I feel like juncos usually kind of um, forage on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, like if, when you're at a bird feeder, they usually like to pick up the leftover seeds on the ground rather than actually fly up to the feeder itself. And for blue jays, sometimes I see people like have feeders with like peanuts in them. They like that. Yeah. Yamina, here's a question for you. Um, this person is asking about good birding places in Puerto Rico. Oh, um, sorry, I, I just bought a plane ticket to go in June, so I'm very excited. <laughs> um, so <laughs> uh, there's a Junque, which is the rainforest, which is the very obvious spot. Um, there is um, the dry forest on the south of the island, Guanica, um, which is amazing because it's a dry forest. And then there's the coast. And then um, on the southwest near um, Mayagüe in that area, um, there is a national wildlife refuge um, that I went to last year that was amazing. There's like a big lighthouse, um, but then it's just sort of like, a, like flat fields um, where you can bird and you're on the cliffs so you can get some of the cool pelagic birds. Um, and then center of the island, there is Maricao Forest, um, which is just another rainforest. And um, then honestly, like pretty much everywhere you go, just keep an eye out. I was like driving past a house and they had um, cattle egret like in their lawn, um, which is like mind boggling to me. Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's lots of spots in, in Puerto Rico to go birding. Have fun, whoever asked that. <laughs> Um, I think that was our last question today. So Sarah Ward, are you still with us? Do you wanna just let everybody know about our next workshop that's coming up before we let folks go for the night? Sure, thanks. Um, my internet's a bit unstable, so I hope I hope everyone can hear me, but um, we've got a couple more workshops coming up as part of this series in May. On, May 11th, there'll be a workshop about pollinators called Growing a Wild NYC. And on May 25th, we will, um, and that one, that, that one is being led by National Wildlife Federation. And on May 25th, we're going to host a workshop with New York City Department of Environmental Protection. And that one will be exploring New York City's water story. So. Um, we'll learn where our drinking water comes from and what happens after it's flushed down our drains and how we can work together to protect our local waterways. So please look for those um, in the series and we hope to see you there. Awesome. Um, so just thank you everybody for tuning in today. Thank you so much, Lily and Yamina. I learned a lot <laughs> and it sounds like people had so much fun. I could see from the chat, they're all excited to share bird stories with you. Um, so we will be sending around the recording of the workshop tomorrow so that you can take a look if there's anything you want to go back and revisit. Um, and, you know, we're, we're all here if you need us, <laughs> if you have more birding questions going forward. So thank you again, Lily and Yamina. And thank you everybody for tuning in. And we'll see you at our next workshop. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Bye, everyone.